What's up, everybody? This is the Welcome to the Show podcast brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show to get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial. That's audibletrial.com forward slash welcome to the show. Also, have you reviewed our podcast yet? Take two minutes to leave a five star rating. That's right, CT, five stars, and review. Uh, our podcast, the Welcome to the Show podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps people to find our show. Um, CT, what's good? Hey, what's up, Manny? I'm good, man. How's you? How was your uh, weekend? Uh, busy. Um, yeah, kids are sick. Okay. Uh, you know, my wife's working nights. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we love baseball yeah sure do sure do but but uh we have a few things we're going to talk about today ct first we're going to talk about why a rod is wrong we're going to discuss a rod's latest video on youtube in which he tells people to swing down in order to create power basically spitting in the face in the face of the launch angle revolution then we're going to get into ct's game of thrones review I want to talk briefly about LeBron James's comments about Magic Johnson in his last episode of The Shop. Then we're going to talk about the Red Sox, who actually lost yesterday to the Baltimore Orioles. But before that, I have some interesting facts about the Red Sox. And finally, we'll round it out with the New York Yankees, and we'll talk and we'll throw out some players of the week at the end of the show. Uh, but CT, let's talk about A Rod. So That's for true. yeah, your your but, favorite, but, right? But before you get into that, just shout out to A Rod real quick. He's great. No, oh, Jesus. All right. So this past weekend, or maybe it was before the weekend, I saw it this weekend. So in my mind, it's this weekend. So in your mind, it's this weekend. Um, A-Rod dropped a video on his YouTube channel, which, by the way, it's a really good YouTube channel. Then if you guys haven't followed A-Rod on YouTube yet, go out there and follow him. Uh, it's, he, he does good instructional videos, lets you into his life a little bit. But then he dropped this bomb on the world, this video in which he gives people a tutorial on how to swing a bat and i'm who am i to 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 tell a rod how to swing right um but i i take issue with what he's showing because i think logically speaking and you know just by using your brain what he's telling you to do is incorrect and i'm not trying to say that a rod wasn't wasn't a good hitter as a player i'm sure that in his mind he thinks that he's doing what he says that he's doing, but if you go back and slow mo his videos or or follow this guy Fuller hitting, he put on his story this thing he calls feel versus real. Um, you'll see that these hitters that think that they're swinging down on a ball, sure they're starting the swing on a downward motion to create a little bit of launch because when you meet the ball, your your swing is going upward. If you hit the top of a ball, my theory is, and I have a feeling that if everybody out there went out there and grabbed a a, a, a baseball bat, tossed the ball to themselves and swung down, I guarantee you that the, what's going to happen is that that ball is going to land straight on the ground. Um, so I think it's okay to teach to start your swing chopping down, but it's not okay to say that when you make contact with the ball that you should be swinging down. Um, so CT, what do you think? Um, well, let me, let me just point out what I thought was pretty ridiculous about A-Rod's video that he kind of went to the extreme saying like, you know, this type of swing and he kind of exaggerated what it is that the modern day players are doing or however you want to look at it. I don't think it's modern. I think people have been doing it and I think Ted it's more Willings like did it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I think it, <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. Interrupt me whenever you want, Manny, you know? Sure uh, will. All right. Um, so yeah, I thought it was a little ridiculous that A-Rod used a very exaggerated, uh, example of what he thinks is, is what the modern baseball player is doing now. So that was exaggerated and I get that that's not what it should be. And he also said that, you know, this type of swing doesn't equal winning or something. He used one of those analogies and I don't entirely agree with that because he, he, uh, you know, we've seen examples throughout the league today of guys that have used that approach like Josh Donaldson and, and uh, Justin Turner and stuff like that. Um, so those guys are great hitters, some of the best in the league. So I don't completely agree with A-Rod on that. But for mm -hmm. the most part, I agreed with a lot of what he said. The only thing I, I think that people need to realize is that, you know, 
if you were to stand up and get a bat and also also to just i don't even know where to start with this to, to actually because the way that he's displaying that he does the swing is not how he really swings but for the most part guys like a rod and trout do swing down but by the time that they get to the ball their swing is already on the way up but it's right. not like a. <clears throat> it's it's kind of like the way that i see it is that you got guys like josh donaldson that they start their bat they get their bat in the zone a lot earlier than guys like a rod and trout do so with the bat in the zone a lot earlier if that ball is passing anywhere near in that zone, it's going to get hit. It's probably going to go in the air. Yeah, I guarantee. I, you know, that's probably what's going to happen. But for a guy like A-Rod, and I've seen a lot of examples where he doesn't do this, but mostly when you don't see him swing down is because the ball isn't down. The ball's up in the zone. Pitchers don't really ever aren't supposed to throw fastballs up in the zone because that's a guaranteed home run. Why? Because their swing is already, is already there. They just got to get the bat out, and it's already gone for a home run. But the way that they're pitched to, and I think you'll see is like they, they throw it low to these guys a lot and they're reaching down to get it. By the time that they pull their bat up, it's already on its way up. It doesn't really make I wish I could kind of like show a visual of this. But if you were to stand up and swing the bat down and also note that this is why it looks weird when A-Rod explains it because he's standing straight up. But nobody ever stands exactly straight up when they're swinging. They always have a tilt in their torso. And if you look at Pedro Martinez when he pitched... You know, he's the ball's coming over the top, <clears throat> but his torso is tilted. So it's kind of like he's really throwing sidearm, but he's mm -hmm. tilting his torso. So it's like it's coming over the top. To me, it's like the same thing. You know, he's swinging down, but the tilt in his upper body has the bat at an angle. When the bat finally comes around, it's already at an angle, which is kind of like what this angle launch angle shit that everybody's talking about is. It's just that mm -hmm. he's. His bat is in the zone for a smaller portion of the swing. What I what I like about it is that he's right. That's the quickest path to the ball is coming straight down from where you have your bat in the back where your elbow up. It's the quickest path. It's a faster it's a faster swing. You're going to end up hitting the ball harder. Yeah, you might not get those, you know, you might not hit every ball in the air, but I think it's ridiculous that for the MLB they want to just completely ignore that ground balls can can be, you know, success you can have successful ground balls or line drives not everything has to be a, a home run or nothing and i think the point that he was trying to make is that there's a lot less contact now in the league yeah. and guys are striking out more than they're hitting and it is i think it is partly because of these new you know types of swings and sorry i just went on for a rant no it's all good it's all good and i i agree i agree with what you said that his his style of hitting is a quicker path to the ball which means should mean less less strikeouts but that I mean that wasn't necessarily true for a rod he struck out a lot and so did so did mike trout mike trout led the league in baseball and strikeouts for a while um but we're seeing a new breed of hitters in today's game and we're seeing that this this new style of hitting for some works i, I don't think I, they call we call it a revolution because so many we're seeing it more often now but the fact of the matter is that very few people do it you know, successfully, like, like, like I, I would say probably Josh Donaldson has been the most successful launch angle guy. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and JD Martinez, even though he doesn't necessarily have a launch angle, his, his hitting instructor, Craig Wallenbrock is one of these hitting gurus that preaches this. And, and I think Ryan Braun is seeing him now. A few people have seen him before. Um, and you have the Doug Ladders with the Justin Turners and stuff like that. Um, and I think that the problem is, is in the branding of it. Like in calling it the launch angle revolution, that immediately, you know, you what first comes to mind is a guy like Joey Gallo, who, by the way, this season, he seems to have changed his swing a bit, his approach. He's playing a lot better than he has in the past. He's not all strikeout or nothing anymore. I mean, he strikes yeah, he, out a lot still, but he's, he, he's he better. Chokes, he chokes up a little bit now, too. In two yeah, strikes. and he credits um, Luis Gonzalez for that, Wow, believe it or not. I, I read something on him talking about that. But anyway. I haven't heard that uh, name in a while. Right? Uh, steroids. Um <laughs> <coughs> But by the same token, you know, I also, you know, I feel like with this new hitting style, what I was trying to say is what the launch angle revolution brings up in your mind is an exaggerated uppercut swing. But if you look at some hitters in today's game who, who use this style of hitting, their swing isn't necessarily so uppercut. I mean, I don't know. Is Cody Bellinger considered a, uh, 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 a launch angle guy? 
Um, I would say yeah because I think he's been practicing that since he was a kid. Not not that he's like an uppercut, but his swing is definitely more towards what we're what your what your argument is versus yeah. yeah what's that's what I was gonna say because I feel like I haven't heard his name being thrown out there as much. But I've been watching a lot of video on him because he's hitting home runs left and right this season, and he has an exaggerated uppercut swing, but he's making contact. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but th- and then you have guys like Giancarlo Stanton, who I don't think if you look at Giancarlo Stanton's swing, it's not exactly an uppercut swing. It's a straight level through the zone swing. He's just really strong. Um, I don't know, man. I, I think that the-, the data supports there's an argument m- that's being made for launch angle that it's almost for me, it's difficult to argue against. But then when you have guys like Alex Rodriguez making the arguments that they have, he is Alex Rodriguez. You know, he's one of the greatest players of all time. My biggest issue, which I said at the beginning with the whole video, is I have no problem with him saying you should swing down on the ball because if you, th- that's a shorter path to the ball, and by the time you make contact, you're on your way up or whatever anyway, yada, yada, yada. My biggest issue with him is that he literally grabs a ball and he shows you this is where you hit it, bop, and he, like, chops down on it. And it's just like that – It's 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 like if you stop to think for one minute, hit the top of the ball – it's it's just gonna go straight to the ground. I mean, I, I said it already. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but that yeah. to me was was where I got lost with with his video. Yeah, look, I, I'm not gonna lie. I've thought about that a lot, and I've thought about like what could he, what could you possibly gain from hitting the top of the ball, right? But the way that I see it is, is that he practiced that, Trout practiced that, Barry Bonds practiced that, and a yeah. whole bunch of other. MLB players have practiced hitting the top of the ball. Maybe that's just their way of of being disciplined as to not try to hit everything up in the air, you know? Yeah. And those home runs, the home runs are going to come anyways. For the way I see it is that if you it's more important for me to me it makes more sense to try to hit the ball as hard as you can than trying to lift the ball in every chance that you get because not every pitcher is going to give you that that type of pitch, you know? If if a uh, if there's a ball in a, in a spot that's your weakness, you how are you gonna how can you possibly think that you're gonna get that ball in the air if it's like on the lower outside of the plate? You're gonna have to reach for that. I think yeah. it's easier to hit balls like that if you're coming from an up an above approach instead of a leveled approach. I think for the level approach, if the ball's not in that zone, you're not even you're not gonna hit it. You're gonna you're just gonna swing and miss. Is mm-hmm. what I think. Now I know a rod strike struck out a lot. When he was in the league, but I think I'd be interested to see how many times he actually, sw- you know, swung and whiffed, which is yeah. what I think is 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 another way to look at a player that can't really make that much contact. Because to me, Arod made great contact. Guys like Jose Altuve make great contact, so on and so forth. But you know, it'd be interesting to see how many times he actually swung at the bat and whiffed. How many times these guys are whiffing because they're not even putting the ball in play anymore. You know, it, it's 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 really bad when there's more strikeouts now than there are yeah. hits. Yeah, you know? I agree. And CT, and, I can I can tell you how much how many times he swung and missed. Um, well, so Alex Rodriguez, swinging swinging strikes in the beginning of his career. So it went it went it was like a perfect curve. It started off at eleven. Per, well, that's not true. That's two thousand and two. That's just the earliest that we have this stat. In 20, 2002, it was at 11%, and the lowest it, it came to its lowest at, in 2010, which was 8.9%, and then he ended his career swinging and missing a lot more at 13.1%. And his well, whiff rate... That age, yeah. Yeah, that might be age. Um, I, I, thought, I thought Fangrass had whiff rate. Well, well is, is, are the numbers that you're looking at good or bad? Or I don't even know, because I don't really look at those stats, but... The, the point I'm trying to make is that I don't know. I, I think the only benefit they get out of swinging at the top of the ball is their discipline to not try and get under everything mm-hmm. and lift the ball for a home run. That's the only way I see it. But yeah, you're right. If you're hitting the top of the if you're hitting the top of the ball, it is going to go straight down. But then again, they're not when they're dis- when they're displaying their swings, they're standing straight up in front of a tee or in front of a ball, whatever, mm-hmm. and they're bringing the bat down. They're still doing that for the most yeah. part, and I've seen exa- I've seen examples on a bunch of YouTube videos where they're not doing that. But mostly, when you don't see them swing down, is because the ball isn't down. The ball is up in the zone, like at their chest. Mm-hmm. They're trying to. They're, they don't have to go down and get it. But when they do have to go down and get it, by the time that the bat comes around, it's at a tilt. It's that. It's 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 giving you that same type of tilt or leveled action that you're looking for with these new swings. Except it's only in a smaller part of the of the swing it's in a smaller window but to me there's a lot more p- 
potential energy because it's basically like you're looking at a, at a curve or a parabola, however you want to look at it. Wow, and it's word. the it's the peak of the curve, mm-hmm. the way I look at it. Everybody so, ends up there. Nobody ends up. Nobody ends up swinging straight down. Everybody yeah. ends their swing straight up. The the ball's gonna come. The bat the the bat is coming up anyways. So a, a hitter like uh, just to go back, a hitter like Ichiro Suzuki, who is like one of the greatest hitters of all time, swung at like six percent as as strikes um i'm trying to look at barry bonds was way lower but we know he's like the most patient hitter of all time um and then you have guys like like david ortiz was on par with a rod a little bit better than a rod but on par with him around 10 between 8 and 10 um so it's it's, yeah you're right and then you have like who's a big launch angle guy now that we're talking about i don't want to exaggerate with joey gallo but who's like who would you say is a big launch angle guy? Uh, I guess Josh Donaldson is the. I mean, not. I only go to Josh Donaldson because he got up in front of a camera and explained that you know don't worry about squash squishing the bug, don't worry about yeah. swinging down or anything. And and I agree that there's advantages to that, but I also think that you're there's advantages to both. But at the end of the day, when 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 they're making contact and it's the solid connect between the the meat of the bat and the ball, it's always in that little window is always usually the same yeah so i don't really think it matters i just think there's advantages and disadvantages to both so yeah yeah with josh donaldson yeah. it was similar to a rods there were points where it was lower and points where it's higher this this season okay. he's at he's at 13.4 percent but his lowest was 9.9 actually nine nine on the dot right there um so i don't know i mean i i guess i guess what we're the the my conclusion for this is Whatever works for you works for you. Like I, I, I don't want to talk about my hitting when we played amateur baseball because I wasn't a good hitter. <clears throat> but when I started to feel things a little bit better toward the end, before I had my daughter, and then I stopped playing, um, mm-hmm. is I did I did try I did try for a leveled swing. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't trying to uppercut. And um, the last hit I had was probably the the best hit I ever had in amateur baseball. I the thing, that. I stopped the squish the bug. Instead, I just kicked my foot facing second base instead of kicking and then squishing the bug. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Or whatever it is that they used to teach you. And that worked for me f- like phenomenally. But again, that's only one swing, one sample size. That's not good enough. But it, in just seeing the video, that was the only thing that, that bothered me about A-Rod's thing. I agree. When you look at Trout's video and A-Rod's video, it looks like they're chopping down. But again, when they meet the ball... The swing is on the way up. So, and I, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if there was launch angle in A Rod's time. Twenty fifteen was when Statcast came around. So I don't know if we can see A Rod's uh, launch angle. But I'm sure that if we look at Mike Trout really quick, that he has, you know, he's his his swing is not a negative degree swing. You know what I'm saying? It's no. not going down. Well, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. When there, whenever oh. you get a chance, whenever you get a chance, and anyone, anyone listening, if you have a bat nearby, get up. Swing the bat like the way A Rod says, straight down, right? How hold the bat in front of you where you think you would be meeting a baseball, but you're swinging straight down. Mm-hmm. But just tilt your torso a little bit. You're you have, an, an you have the tilt in a bat that's gonna hit the ball. That when if, if you do hit the ball correctly, which at the point of your bat's fastest, I, I guess since it is kind of like a curve, that would be the bat's peak of like speed or or coming off of the peak or whatever. And just imagine yourself hitting a ball in the strike zone with a little tilt in the bat. You're still swinging down. I'm pretty sure you can agree that you're swinging the bat faster coming down than coming around. Or however, I'm. I don't want to shit on the launch angle thing completely because I don't disagree with everything, and and mm-hmm. I don't actually don't disagree with any of it. It clearly works for some people. Mm-hmm. But if you but if you stand up, swing down, give a little tilt in your bat b- with your torso, and you still squish the bug and everything, how could you not? understand that the ball is going to go in the air you know yeah 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 i think it's like uh, the, i just think it's the same thing i s- just looking at stat cast for mike trout he has a career average uh 15.7 degree launch angle and his highest was last year at 18.6 right game of thrones ct this is the segment of the show and i think there's only two left so it was a very short-lived segment because i I think it's two episodes left right or is it one yeah 
It should be two more. Yeah. Two more left. So this is the segment where CT, a Game of Thrones enthusiast, tries to convince me, an adversary, to show, to watch the show by reviewing the latest episode. Go ahead, CT. Well, first, let me let me start off by saying that I actually didn't love this episode. It was the first time in a long time that I watched the Game of Thrones episode where I was like, all right, like this, this is a little bit. It was it just it was kind of dead in a lot of points, you know, mm. um, I felt like the flow of it was kind of off. You know, at one point they're all rejoicing and, you know, drinking and eating. And then another point spoilers coming up. But in another point, they shoot down a dragon and nice. You know, just take the dragon right out of it. They just shoot it down, and it just, it was very unexpected when they killed the dragon. Um, and in the end, the, so, so the antagonist, which means bad guy, right? Uh, antagonist is a bad guy, yeah. 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 The <laughs> antagonist of <laughs> the main antagonist now, now that the Night King is dead, the main antagonist of the show, Circe, which is like, she's queen she's like the ruler of the seven kingdoms what she did at the end was exactly in her character's description it's just the way that they did it it's kind of like they try to force the evilness on you mm. if that makes any sense it does um for the most part i thought that i didn't love the episode i liked it because in the beginning you, there's a lot of conflict even within the own even within like the one kingdom the north i mm-hmm. feel like there's like a lot of a lot of conflict it all revolves around the iron throne which is like the you know leader of the seven kingdoms and all that all that good stuff i know i'm confusing you but yeah my (laughs) my review for that episode was that it wasn't that great uh you know i still think it's a great show overall (laughs) okay uh so it wasn't yeah continue there there was also uh apparently there was a starbucks cup in in one of the scenes i saw that yeah and conspiracy theories right here i don't think that was a mistake i don't think that was a mistake why would they leave it there? Like like as a little Easter egg or whatever? No, for a Star- Starbucks probably paid them under under the table like a billion dollars. Like here, put a put our put our cup in your in your show or something. <laughs> There's no way that that's just randomly of you know, out of nowhere is gonna be a Starbucks cup Apparently, on the table. Yeah, that's true. Apparently, uh the Wait, what did I just do here? Apparently, that that Starbucks cup has been removed from the show digitally. So if you if you catch it on HBO Go or something, you'll never see it again. Only that. Did you see it while you, when you watched the show? No, but I have the episode recorded. So oh, so you'll be able to see it. Yeah. Uh, but alleg- allegedly, according to my sources, um, y- Yahoo or Google, um, the the cup has been digitally removed. So. But yeah, I saw that. That was all over the place. That's how you know that a show is is just it, like it's too big, too, like too big for its own good because people yeah. are talking about a Starbucks when we are too. Starbucks cup uh, yeah. left in an episode. Free promo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's free promo for Starbucks, but I don't think it's free because I think Starbucks figured out a way to you know get this done on purpose. Yeah. By the way, what's HBO going to do when Game of Thrones is gone? I don't think they have anything going right now. I mean, they, I think they have they have some shows here and there, but there isn't anything There's, like this. Well, I mean, I, I, I watch mean, um, Insecure. I love Insecure. It's a good show. I, I want to watch Barry. One. I haven't. I, I heard Barry's really good. I might start watching yeah. that soon. Which, but the, what's the show? What's the show with the guy that's a assassin, but he tries yeah, to act? That's Barry. Oh, okay, yeah, that I, I do want to watch that one as well, yeah. Yeah, I want to watch that, but there isn't that hour long. I'm sure that there is. There's, there's um that sci-fi one, the West or Westworld or whatever. I haven't watched that. Yeah, it, it seems like too much for me. But I mean, it's it seems like HBO has been writing on the coattails of HB of uh, Game of Thrones for a while now. I wonder, you know, I mean, something else has well, to come out after this. I mean, well, the good thing is is that HBO has like HBO Now or HBO Go. I forgot what it's called. It's kind of like its own Netflix. Mm-hmm. So it has mm-hmm. all these shows there. It has like, uh, what's that show that you like? Uh, the, the Wire. Wire. The, the Wire's on there. Everything's Sopranos on there. On there. Yeah, everything's on there, and they they have they stay killing it with shows. So I think they'll be all right. Yeah, Boardwalk Empire. They're all mm. there. Yeah, that's Nef- good one. Netflix shows have just been so good, man. That I, I just lately I've been on a documentary kick because of uh because of Screwball. So I watched Fire Festival last time, and this Gotta time that. that was good. This time I watched um one on HBO, believe it or not, called Out for Blood. It's about Elizabeth Holmes, I think her name is. I don't know if you've heard of this story before. 
Not but sure. But she was she was being touted like the next Steve Jobs, like like the the person, the next big inventor in Silicon Valley who was going to change the world for the better. This this and that. She came up with a way to quickly get lab results for your for blood, your blood samples or whatever. And she yeah. got hundreds of millions of dollars in investors to 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 uh, invest in this company. What the hell is it called? I can't remember what it's called. It's like a, a, it's a crazy ass name. But anyway, um, it turns out she, she was bullshitting. She was using commercially available uh, machines to test people's blood. Um, she was. So it was all fake. It was all fake. All fake. Wow. All complete crock of shit. Not just that, but she, I think she's fake too because her voice, you have to watch it. Her voice is nuts. Like like her voice changes. It sounds like a woman's voice and then it changes to this. She starts talking like this sometimes and like when she's having like the Steve Jobs speeches when she's talking about her stuff and I'm just like, what the hell is wrong with this? <laughs> and she, and her, she looks like a, like a, like she's fake, like a doll. You know what I mean? It's, it was really, it's a really weird documentary. Yeah. This that's not ringing a bell, but I don't know, man. I feel like I'm out of touch with a lot of things. But whatever happened to that show on Netflix where the FBI agent? It's like when the FBI started using psychology to yes, track down uh, serial killers and stuff. Mind Hunter. Yeah, whatever happened to that show? That was a good show. I think there's a season two in the works. It just with with Netflix, they never do things on a yearly basis. Like you know, like Arrested Development came out with season five, I think it was or four. And then it was a few years before they came out with season six, but they only released yeah. half of it. And then it was like a year later they released the other half. And the yeah, same thing happened. Show man. Yeah, yeah. I tried watching episode one of the last one, and I couldn't get through it. But I need to. No, that it's actually not that bad. But. Yeah, I need to force myself. I need to force myself to watch it because I love that show. Season four um, was horrible. Yeah, it, I didn't. So okay, I didn't think it was that bad. But compared to every, to compared to to Arrested Development shows, that is the worst season yeah. for sure um i think it's better than freaking a uh, new girl or some shit like that but it's you know i don't know what i never watched that show exactly you should watch shameless you should watch shameless shameless i think yeah. i watched the first season of that and then i gave up on it but i i, I want to go back i have so many shows that I, I feel like in some ways i feel like i'm in a fortunate position i feel like i'm lucky because i have so much shows that i need to watch still once my kids get older and i have some free time in my hands god damn am i gonna be lazy man <laughs> Holy shit. All right, LeBron James, CT. Before we jump into some baseball, LeBron James, uh, there was a trailer come out for his latest show, The Shop, which I don't know if you've watched it before, but um, it's not bad. He has good guests on it, but it's like poorly produced because he'll have like nine people on the show, but the show's only a half hour. So. Mm who get you know sometimes like the guests won't even talk they'll just be sitting there chilling you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. Yeah. um so this i think it's a good idea but it needs to be revamped a little bit maybe maybe limit the guests the guest list a little bit but anyway in this latest episode he's in the barbershop with lonzo ball and, and i can't remember who else is in there with him and he the guy asks him about magic magic johnson how does he feel about magic johnson leaving and he basically goes off and says, you know, part of the reason why I came to L.A. is because of Magic Johnson and this, this, and he's really disappointed and upset and pissed off at Magic Johnson. And I have a take on this. So I kind of under, I agree with him in a way. I don't I don't I don't begrudge him for feeling upset with Magic Johnson because, you know, he's the one that sold you L.A. Although I think that in a lot of ways, LeBron is in LA, not because of the Lakers, but because of other things he's doing, like like this yeah, like, show, for example. Yeah, like the shop. Like the shop. And I think he's the one that produces, uh, I think it's called Spotlight or Focus or something on ESPN, where they have a spotlight on a play and they have somebody narrating, like like telling you what, what the guy, the player's thinking in the, in the moment. So like, he has some really good ideas. Yeah. But this is this is where my beef comes in. It's, and it's not necessarily with, with LeBron James. It's with the, the sport of basketball as a whole. You notice it mostly is in college basketball, you, you see that coaches are recruiting these players. And then you'll see like a year later, they'll bounce for more money or whatever. It's an issue of, of sticking with your commitment. And it seems to me like when Magic Johnson left the, the Los Angeles Lakers, it didn't have anything to do with... Um, him not being able to do his job properly with him not being able to see his vision go all the way through it seemed to me like he quit because he didn't want to be the guy to fire a coach 
like he like he felt too bad to he he didn't have the guts or something to to do his job essentially and i'm not down with that and then if i was a guy like lebron i'd be like what the fuck like i i came here for this guy like yeah. you can you you know what i mean so i don't know what do you, i don't even know why i want to talk about this it's just i thought it touched on a bigger issue for me um i don't know what's your take i mean, to. I, mean I don't know i I have I haven't really watched the shop. I think it's kind of random that LeBron has all these shows going on while the NBA season is going on. You know, for me as a fan, it's a little annoying because I'd rather I'd rather see you in the gym taking shots than you know having like guests at a barber shop and talking shit or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't care if you do it in the off season. I don't know if this uh, this clearly wasn't done. It's in it's it's his off season because Magic quit you know, with like a couple games left, I think, yeah. and LeBron wasn't even playing anymore, but all the other episodes were going on during the season, whatever. Um, I I get that he's frustrated, but at the same time, the way that he spoke about it, I personally wouldn't do that if I was LeBron James because I'm LeBron James. Like, I'm, I'm basically the next Magic Johnson or whatever, mm-hmm. and Magic Johnson already has lived out his career and beyond that, and he's he hasn't had success in everything. You know, you could say that he's had, he's been successful with the Dodgers, even though they haven't won a World Series, but the Dodgers have been hot, a hot team ever since, or they've stayed a, as a hot team, whatever. They're still a great franchise. Yeah. But I think Magic Johnson failed as being like a talk show host at one point. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? There's yeah. a lot of things that Magic Johnson has done already that LeBron is going to end up doing, mm-hmm. probably owning a team or being president of a team or whatever the hell Magic Johnson was. There's probably a chance that LeBron James is going to do it. And when that time comes and, and you do your own thing, then I think you can speak on Magic Johnson. But I don't really think like, you know, speak your mind, do whatever you want to do. But I, I also don't think that anybody's in a position to say anything to Magic Johnson because he's he's Magic Johnson, you know? Yeah, yeah. If that, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I, and, I didn't. And, I, I didn't like completely what he said, but I get that he's frustrated, you know. And why do it? I guess this is my. You're, you're right. This is what I guess bothered. What what bothers me about it, although I wasn't completely bothered by it, is why do it on your show on the shop, um, and then make that the promotion video that you put out there. Why not go talk to to Magic in person? Which maybe he did, but then aren't you kind of betraying? your friendship to him or or your trust yeah, with like, him to then yeah. do it on your show for ratings or whatever i don't know then I, then again Ma- i mean did magic johnson take into account bronze trust and friendship when he just quit because he didn't tell i see this is why i get that i get why lebron is mad because magic johnson just bounced without even yeah. saying anything to anybody yeah i think i think that press conference was his way of telling everybody yeah. But at the same time, it's like, that, you know, you're not yeah. you're not him. So can you really speak on him? Can you really understand where he, where what, why Magic Johnson did what he did? I don't right. think there's a lot of people that can. Another thing, too, that I don't like is why do you have Lonzo Ball, of all people, in that I shop? Know. You know, kind of putting him on the spot. His career hasn't even started yet. You mm-hmm. know, he can't just fall back on a on a Hall of Fame career like LeBron does. You know, for all I know, Lonzo is like burning bridges because yeah. of LeBron. <laughs> He's like, uh, fuck, man. And yeah, and Le- yeah, that's what LeBron says in the video. Basically, is um, that he's up. Ups- you know, why not give me a call? At least, at least let me know ahead of time. This, this, and that. But then again, who the fuck are you, LeBron? You're a player. You know what I mean? That's and that's the thing. Exactly. And, and and the reason why people have a bad taste in their mouth for LeBron. I happen to like LeBron James. Um, yeah, I, LeBron. I I was a Knicks fan growing up, so I hate Michael Jordan because he destroyed my team's chances of oh, ever God. winning a championship. Stop. So in my mind, LeBron James is the greatest of all time. But whatever, that's neither here nor there. CT. I disagree. Neither, neither I disagree. Here. I disagree. Um, but who are you, dude? And and you know, so the reason why people have a bad taste about LeBron James is because, um, since he since he became this figure in basketball, where he's like the savior, and and you know what? Let's give him credit because since he was drafted, the ratings in basketball have gone up. He he, in a lot of ways, he saved basketball because it was in the dumps in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, and he was going, he's championship after championship. I don't know how many consecutive years he went to the, to the finals. Um, but throughout that whole time, he's, he's the one making the, the decision on firing coaches and which players you're going to sign and all this stuff. And that's a slippery slope that we're seeing in basketball now that, that fans don't like, you know what I mean? That the players are the ones that run the show. And, and in, in a way it's what makes basketball so great that you get to follow a player and it's almost like a soap opera. But at the same time, that team component, that 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 
that is necessary to win a championship. I don't care if you have the greatest player in the sport. It doesn't mean you're going to win a championship. LeBron James is the perfect example of that. Um, you know, you're losing that aspect of it, the team component. You know what I mean? He seems selfish in a way. Like, yeah. like it's a, it's about the team. It's not about you. You know what I mean? Yeah, like there's no way to prove that LeBron is running the show. But, I mean, he gets to a team. They fire a coach. It happened yep. in Cleveland. They uh, signed his friends. Know, <laughs> yeah, they signed his friends. At Lakers are about to sign his friend again, uh, Ty mm-hmm. Lue, mm-hmm. to be the coach. So I'm not I'm not saying we can prove that LeBron is running this show, but, I mean, come on. Like, how many times are we going to see the same shit happen again? And, again, uh, I think Magic Johnson has his own side of the story. We All, all we know is that he quit yeah. without telling people, but I think he tweeted that, like, the truth will come to light or something. I don't know, some cryptic tweet. It, I hate it was. I hate it, was some, it was something like uh, Genie Bus and I forget who else – cc'd him by mistake on an email or something and i guess they wanted him to fire luke walton and he didn't want to do it or whatever so instead of severing his friendship with genie bus who he later was seen having dinner with like earlier this week or something or, or late last week um he decided to step down from the role which is kind of you know like come on that's why you're gonna step down as you know as president you know yeah. the, your biggest move was lebron james last year you're going to give that one year and then walk away like that to me that seems kind of shady i love magic johnson um i don't remember him playing so much in the 80s i remember when he left because he had hiv or whatever and then when he came back i remember staying up really late to watch his game when he came back and um but that that's the most i remember him as a player but in terms of like the highlights and stuff i appreciate the kind of player he was like you said lebron is almost like identical to to the type of player that magic johnson was um but this was never to my recollect recollection this was never magic johnson just abandon your team like this you know what i mean um yeah. so and, but but like you said we don't know there might be something else in there i don't yeah. know and real quick there's my last point on this whole nba thing and the players running the show and everything i i, I have barely watched any of the playoff games and i'm not saying this is the reason i'm kind of uninterested baseball season is still like for me it's like still the beginning kind of and Mm -hmm. i got a fantasy baseball team to run which is doing great by the way thanks for asking uh (laughs) but my thing with basketball players these days and it's not just like not every basketball players like this but it's guys like russell westbrook and kyrie irving and kevin durant that these guys i mean they're basically gods amongst amongst men you know like they have their fan base nba players fan bases are so ridiculous you know and Mm -hmm. there's a lot there's too many examples where these guys they feel like hurt they they're like their feelings are hurt at the end of a loss and they get asked a question about it and they'll kind of hit you with like the next question or like they'll ignore like stupid question next i'm like what example are you setting for children that are looking at you that are just going to accept that this is how like when you're the man you got to be you got to be like this you got to be snotty you got to like look down at people like if i'm like if i'm a uh if i'm a reporter sitting in a conference room and i'm asking russell westbrook like oh like you you shot three for 50 tonight like you know is something wrong and he hits me with that next question i might go up there and hook him in the face i'm like yo i'm doing my job (laughs) I'm doing my job, and you're being a you're being a little a little bit like a little kid about it. Little bitch, go ahead. You say it, little bitch. Little bitch, you're a little bitch. I, I don't even like Russell Westbrook <laughs> anymore. I used to like him, but I don't really like him no more. Yeah, no, I, I agree, and 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 um and so this is where let's we steer the ship back into baseball a little bit. This is where <laughs> yeah, this is where in baseball this is where in baseball you you appreciate a little bit more that they do stick to a like a script that's always been there i think there's certain things that need to change like i think there's certain things like bat flips that you should just let go at this point the pitcher wants to scream on the mound let him scream on the mound shit like that let it go things that make the game fun but you you're required as a player to speak to the media after every game and in in baseball as opposed to basketball you're playing double the game so you're doing this every single night and if you're if you're a member of a big team it's even worse. Like I, I, we have a buddy who who came on the show, Alfred Alvarez, who for Con la Base Llena, he has MLB credentials, and he goes to he goes to games and stuff, and and he'll he'll say like I can't even get Yankee credentials or or these big teams because there's so much media in there. So just imagine having to answer questions every single day. And in baseball, most of the time you fail. Like if you're a 300 hitter, you're you're a phenomenal hitter. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's hitting the ball three out of ten times. Yeah. Um, whereas you have guys like 
again, like you said, Russell Westbrook is the guy who keeps saying next question. I think it's, it's one specific reporter that he trashes on all the time. Um, you only play you only play two or three times a week. Like it's not like you have to do this shit every day. You know what I mean? Like not, it's not even that, man. It's like you're Russell Westbrook, and it's guys like Russell Westbrook, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. Like it's the big the guys, why, the big names. Yeah, you got you guys are superstars. You've earned it. You've earned the right to do whatever the hell you want. But the way your their attitude sometimes is annoying. The reason why they shouldn't even it's like they're kind of like just being you know they're like not they're not even gonna be, let be bothered by mm-hmm. the thought of somebody asking them a legit question. That's the that's the thing. I can understand if the reporter's being a dick, but I haven't seen too many examples of that. And these guys choose to just, you know, act like they're better than answering such a in their minds a dumb question. But I'm like, yo, you guys are the players on the court with the ball in your hands most of the time. You're mm-hmm. you're you're a big part of the reason why it was such a bad game. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Uh, d- and don't don't do the media don't do the media circuit if you're not going to answer questions. Yeah, don't and, be don't be an NBA player. Go go play at Rucker Park where there is yeah, no media. If, exactly. if it's that if it's that annoying to you, and and I, and you're right, what you said. I like that baseball players do stick to a script, and I also like that NBA players get to speak their mind a lot freer than baseball mm-hmm. players do. Yeah, but I yeah. think there needs to be like a middle a midway yeah. meet meet for those things. I don't want my baseball players to be robots. But I also do. I enjoy a baseball player that just hits you with a generic answer. Just hit me with a generic answer, man. That's it. Yeah, that might be yeah. why. That might be why the NFL fines their players if they don't speak to the media. I don't know if the NBA does that, but maybe that's something you have to do. Like you're required to speak to the media. If you don't speak to the media, you're gonna get a fine. And and for, for some of these players, it's chip change, but at least you're getting something out of it. I don't know. And then take that money and. I don't know. Put it in the donate it to somebody. I don't know the the Go. raise kids how to behave like men foundation. For, I don't know for anybody for anybody wondering. Go look at Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan when they were the best team in basketball. Go look at their post game interviews and see how they conducted themselves. Mm-hmm. And 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 tell me and tell me you don't feel some sort of like respect for these guys or whatever. Without even you know you're not gonna look at a Michael Jordan video and not know who Michael Jordan is. But mm-hmm. compare him to someone from today, like it's ridiculous. I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree, one hundred percent. And what I meant to say with the sticking to the script of baseball, I hate the. I, I do hate the generic answer. Oh, we're gonna go out there. We're gonna do this and that. And I'm feeling great today. And this is a, g- give me a little bit more personality. But speak to the media. Like you'll have Giancarlo Stanton is straight out of the shower, and the media is you know attacking him shirtless. It was a joke, a running joke, I think, <laughs> in the clubhouse, according to CC Sabathia, that the media <laughs> always caught Giancarlo Stanton shirtless and shit. But in in the NBA, not only do these guys get to go in the clubhouse, unwind, do the shit, they don't have to speak to the media until they come out and speak out in the podium. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you're making the decision to take that walk over to the podium to answer questions and then you're being an asshole i mean in some cases these players get that get cornered like outside of their locker room or whatever i understand but th- this is your this is your format to well aside from social media i think maybe that might be the problem i was going to say this is your chance to speak to the fans maybe these nba players are thinking why do i need to talk to this fucking reporter i could just get on my instagram later and drop a video and tell my fans straight up how i was feeling or whatever you know what i mean which i guess i'm yeah. I, you know then, then we're kind of out of a job. My, yeah, my beef, and again, my beef is mo- you seen you seen a uh, Marshawn Lynch give that kind of yeah. attitude at mm-hmm. a press conference. But my beef is with NBA players because NBA players have everything. They can wear what they want. Mm-hmm. They their 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 culture is intertwined with hip hop, which is the most popular music in America today. They get the highlights. They get to dunk. They get to showboat. They get to do whatever the hell they want, and then yep. for them to kind of turn around and be and be like dick about a dick at, in in a in a post game interview, it's just annoying. Like it just annoys the shit out of me. With football players, I don't have that much of a beef with because they don't get the luxury of like signing that max contract deal. Not everybody does, you know. Some players do, yeah. but you get what I'm you get what I mean. I got you, man. Shit, all man. Right. Yeah, it's all good, man. Don't worry about it. It's okay. Let's talk Red Sox real quick. So they had a pretty bad loss to the Baltimore Orioles last year. Had a little taste of the Yankee medicine from last year. <clears throat> but I wanted to talk about what happened in the week prior to yesterday's game. Because um, in those seven games, they won six out of them. They were averaging eight runs per game in that in, in that span, that seven-game span. They scored 34 runs in that seven games. 
Wait, no, that's not true. It was more than 34. Eight runs, six. It was like 60-something runs. They scored 34 runs in that four-game series against the White Sox. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the last 15 games since Michael Chavis, well, now 16 games, but before yesterday we're talking, in the in the last 15 games since Michael Chavis was called up to the to the big league roster, they went 10-5. and five. He hit six home runs with a 354 batting average, a 466 on base, and a 771 slugging. Here's my questions. One, where the fuck did this guy come from? And two, aside from yesterday's loss to the Baltimore Orioles, you have to start feeling you have to be feeling good about the Red Sox right now, no? Yeah, I I feel good. I feel like the Red Sox are, you know, coming back into form and Chris Sale finally got his win the other day. He pitched great. Mm-hmm. Um, this Chavez is, or I don't know how to, how we say his name, but Ch- I think it's Chavis. I have no idea. Either, Chavis? 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 Let's just. Chavis was a first round pick that much. I know, but I think it just took him a while to develop in the minors. I think he actually got off to like a slow start and I actually think he got banned for, for which I remember last in season one of welcome to the show podcast. Mm-hmm. We were talking about guys like Alex Reyes and all these other guys that get busted for PEDs in the minors. And should we look at those guys the same way in the majors? Because, you know, they technically didn't cheat in the majors. Mm-hmm. They cheated in the minors. So, yeah, Chavis got got banned for a performance-enhancing uh, substance in the minors. So he missed 80 games for that. Nice. Uh, but, yeah, ever since he's been called up, I think he has the four longest home runs of the season for the Red Sox. And I think his longest home run is the longest in, like, the last three, three four years. So, wow. I don't know. I didn't. I don't think anybody thought he'd be this good. I think he would have been on the starting roster if he was this yeah. good. But I'm glad that he's here now, and uh, you know, I'm. I hope they figure something out with Devers and move him because apparently he was drafted as a shortstop. So I hope that, and then he's been working at third base. So I hope they figure something out with uh, Devers and put him at third, man. And fuck it, Devers isn't really doing shit anyways. I don't know what you're gonna get. This is funny because we talked about this a couple weeks ago yeah. about moving Devers, and um, it seems like since then he just he can't get out of his own way. I don't know if you would get anything for Devers at this point. No, you might not get anything, but I mean, maybe he doesn't have an everyday role anymore. You know, maybe he's he's Eduardo Nunez can go to second, and when he comes back, and Devers can just be a a, a bench, be on the bench. It, I don't know. It, it's funny because it's he's still a young kid. He's still only 22 years old. So the sky's the limit for for Rafi Devers. But it's funny how one moment carried this kid, you know, into essentially an entire season worth worth of games, like 150 plus games. It was yeah. that one moment with the Rodgers Chapman that that blew this kid up. Because since then, he hasn't been that good. You know what I mean? Yeah, Chavez he's has only played. 16 games he's already second well he's tied for second in the home runs for the team so yeah it's crazy man and he has, he already has a one i know you don't believe in f war i don't i don't really believe in war either but i think if everybody's being compared to the same stat it's you know then you can use it as a comparison because you know whatever everybody everybody's you're using the same information to compare everybody but anyway he has mm-hmm. the third best war in on the team already in 16 games and he's tied with mookie with that so Wow. I mean, hopefully, I mean, hopefully not for the Yankees sake. Hopefully he's not the real deal. But for your sake, since since you're my cousin, um, I hope I hope that you got yourself a little a little rookie action here, man. It's, it's just crazy rookie. to think. Yeah, it's just crazy to think that we basically don't have anything in the farm system. Like I looked I looked at our prospects the other day. It's not looking have, good. Like we you have the worst ranked. Guys. Yeah, yeah, you have the worst <laughs> ranked farm system in baseball. And it's 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 funny that even, you know, this guy isn't just a good player he's he's ranking in terms of like slugging and exit velocity and you know home run like average distance i think he's mm-hmm. like third in the league not just with yeah. rookies but i'm pretty sure he's leading rookies at this point but it's just crazy that we don't really have anything in the farb system yet this guy comes out of nowhere and he's just inserted himself into like the rankings it mm-hmm. just makes me think that these they're making these guys in a lab or something you know well like, oh we you know it, it, the, the, so there was a study that came out on Baseball Reference, and um, it, not Baseball Reference, Baseball Prospectus about the balls being juiced again because home run rates are through the roof again. And uh, apparently, there's a league, a minor league system, the Pacific Coast League, or that's an independent league. That's not a minor league system. They're using the same balls that they are in Major League Baseball, and their home run rates are through the roof too. Well. Wow. Um, yeah. So maybe this here's my conspiracy theory. 
CT. Maybe Michael Chavis, Chavis, um, is seeing this kind of uh, results. He's a good player. I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but maybe it's be- maybe the balls are helping him out a little bit. You know, maybe that little difference in the baseball yeah. is making all the difference in the world. And I say this not just because of Michael Chavis. I do on Call to the Pen. I do a weekly uh, player power ranking based on hitting. And there were people on last week's list that I just never thought would be on a on a power ranking list. Like there was guys like Marte out of Arizona. How do you say his name? Uh, Cattell or something? Cattell Marte, yeah, Starley Marte's cousin, I think. Yeah. So Cattell Marte was on on the list. He was he's raking. This guy Ronnie Rodriguez, who is a nobody if you look at his stats, he's raking. Adalberto Mondesi is a good. He's a good player, but he's, he's been not a power hitter. He's not a power hitter. He's raking this season. You know what I yeah. mean? Like these guys are hitting bombs. Who uh Cattell Marte hit 14 home runs last last year. He already has nine this year. Yeah. Like I got him I got him on my team. You know who I'm pissed by the way, now that we're on the subject of home runs and shit? Eduardo Rodriguez. No, not Eduardo Rodriguez. Nunez? Eduardo Escobar. Escobar. Ooh, God, didn't I love that guy. Shit. Didn't do <laughs> shit on my team. I think I, I got drafted him, f- him in the eighth round. I got him for he free. Yeah, he didn't do shit on my team. I had to drop him because I have some injured players. You pick him up. Mm -hmm. I think he hit a home run the day before you picked him up. He's been on a tear ever since. But not just even this year. Remember Glaber Torres last year? He hit more home runs in a month than he did in all of his minor league, Mm -hmm. you know, career. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, I I think I I do really think that there is something to these juice baseballs. And, you know, I like a good conspiracy theory. So (laughs) I agree. (laughs) <laughs> I I mean I think I think it is I think it is I mean it, the the best thing that ever happened was that they started testing these things in the Pacific Coast League. That's kind of that that that's the Pacific Coast League has been kind of like the like baseball uh, chimp whatever what do you call those like the experimental chimps or whatever the fuck you call it lab rats uh, lab rats yeah there you go different animal but um <laughs> they they're testing everything in the pacific coast league and they've seen the home run rate i have to link that article in the in the episode description so people can read it but you're seeing home run rates being increased down there and what, what blows my mind is thinking back last season when we interviewed that guy dr nathan allen do you remember the guy who headed the yeah. uh yeah I the report that, re- yeah. that was my favorite that was like one of my favorite uh episodes yeah, so the, so uh, he's the one that headed the the committee into the into testing the baseballs to see if they were being juiced, and he was saying things like there's you know there's a uniform way to make it blah blah blah, but we can't say definitively whether or not the balls are being juiced. Like to me, that yeah. sounds like this. Is my conspiracy theory is this sounds to me like baseball telling this guy, listen, here's your, here's your committee, here's what you're gonna do. But your results are going to be in, in our favor because, you know, we can't have negative publicity in baseball. Then you have that girl, that the woman on, on the athletic who took a baseball part and she literally can see a difference in minor league baseballs and me, major league baseballs. Like the, 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 the seams are tighter or something and, yeah, and, they, and make it, it makes yeah, it fly make- further or whatever. Yeah, I think I think by making it uh, tighter, you're making the the ball less dense. It cuts through the air quicker. Mm-hmm. I think I think the findings of his report was that the ball carries at least two feet more. But yeah. we're seeing like these sh- sh- Shavis home runs are like bombs. So did you see the Yelich home run the other day? Yeah, it it's third yeah, deck. Yeah, let, <laughs> Yel- yeah, Yelich puts the ball in third deck like it's nothing. And yeah, I'm not saying that he's not. A, you know, when he was on the Marlins, he was a good contact hitter. He not never. Like I don't. I don't think we ever would have thought that he could hit home runs like this at not this like rate. This. Like, no. it's pretty crazy. I agree. All right. Um, was there something else? Oh yeah, David Price has an elbow injury. CT. Like, I, I, I mean, they said ah. that it's retroactive to May third. So to me, that sounds like to me when when they retroactively put a player on the DL. I interpret it to mean that it's not that serious because we're retroactively doing it in order to be able to bring them back sooner if possible. But I don't know. When I hear elbow issues, I don't know. Have you heard anything lately about this? What's going on with Price? No, I haven't heard anything crazy like that you haven't heard. But I agree when it's an elbow issue, I think you're, you're, you can never look at just like a quick return. It's always going to be longer. Yeah. And, and with Yankees fans and Red Sox fans, there's always a lot of shit talking back and forth about David Price. Um, but if I take my Yankee cap off for a second, he's nice. a decent, he's a legit pitcher. He's going to, you know what you're going to get from David Price on on a yeah. start to start basis. He may not strike out 15 hitters and give you a shutout, but he's going to give you that solid six, seven, eight inning outing. 
and allow no more than three runs unless he faces the Yankees. Um, mm. And that's a big loss, man. That's a big loss in that rotation. Yeah, I know it was only a couple of starts, but his uh, his K per nine was a ten point five, which is above his his average. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we we do need a guy like David Price, man. Bad. Yep. Especially yep. our team now, like we can't have we can't we can't. I don't know how the Yankees are doing this. I know we're going to talk about this, but we can't get by with all with injuries like the Yankees are getting by right now. We do, we just don't have the resources. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think it's the depth. I think our depth yeah. is better than your depth. Your players, I think pound for pound, are better, but but we have the depth. Uh, um, that's a good argument. All right, so the Yankees lost uh, Paxton this past weekend. He has never had a knee issue before. Apparently, he's been dealing with a knee issue all season, and the shit hit the fan in his last start. And he was pulled in the third inning and then placed on the IL. Um, and they're saying that he could be out three weeks at least, which, as I always say with the Yankees, that means he's out for at least a month, maybe yeah. maybe even two. Fuck it. Um, thank God that Domingo Herman has arrived this season. And by the way, yep. Domingo Herman was traded for nothing. We got him for nothing. Um, I think he was a throw-in in in one of the trades. I think it was a – how did we get Domingo Herman? It was a, it was a Marlins, Marlins trade for uh, Castro, right? Uh, or the Stanton trade. It might have been. I, to be honest, I don't know because I didn't think any of these players are going to pan out like this. So, And, and just, you know. Domingo Herman reminded me a lot last season of a guy like Ivan Nova, like – a guy who has enough enough stuff to get by in the big leagues, but as soon as he gets into trouble, he unravels. Um, yeah. The difference between Herman and, and Nova is that Herman's stuff is better. I think he has a lot better stuff than Ivanova. Ivanova is a sinker ball pitcher. He rec- he relies on contact. Domingo Herman is a strikeout pitcher. And mm-hmm. this season, what I'm seeing from Domingo Herman is that he's keeping his composure the whole way through. He like he he doesn't. You know, whittle like a flower as soon as some shit happens. He's like, he's confident in his stuff. He's not walking as many hitters. He's still striking out batters. And he has a fun. I mean, he's, he's our, right now he's our ace and he's pitching like an ace in in Major League Baseball. I think he has a sub one whip. Yeah, he does. I mean, God, man, I traded him in fantasy. What the hell's wrong with me, man? I don't know, man. I mean, I can't, I don't know what, I don't know what goes through that genius, genius brain of yours. Shut up, man. Sometimes. You know? Shut your, shut your beautiful mouth, man. You're going to like this, man. Domingo Herman's FIP is 2.72. That's great, it's, man. It's actually higher than his ERA. Which means that which means that he's his his defense is helping him a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, and by the way, by the way, the Yankee defense with Andujar, I'm not trying to shit on Andujar. I like having Miguel Andujar on the field. But you see the difference in the team with Andujar playing third and a guy like Gio or, uh, or Sherla, who, by the way, I don't want I don't want Gio to be our everyday third baseman. Um, but you see the difference defensively. I mean, I think Herman, I mean, yeah. I think Andujar made two errors in his first game back. I saw, uh, yeah, on Saturday. That was Saturday. I saw him make the dumbest error on a double play opportunity. Mm-hmm. He, th- mm-hmm. he just threw the ball into right field. I'm like, all right, like yeah. I think I could have even made a more accurate throw. But yeah, man, and that's um, you know that's actually. I don't know if you were going to make a point right there. Sorry to cut, cut you off. No, go but ahead. I'm surprised that a team like the Yankees, that I think they're one of the most cautious teams in baseball when it comes to their injured players, right? That and Duhar comes back and he's immediately on the field playing third. Yeah. You know? And he was dealing with an arm issue. I Something tells me, I agree with you 100%, but something tells me that the glut of injuries on this team for, is forcing them to to rush him back. I agree with you. I, I, the Yankees are known to be super cautious. Like if if surgery is on the table, they're gonna go surgery usually. Um, and instead of that, they let this guy play through it, and he's back up on the field. Um, but we'll see. I, I mean, I don't know. They I mean, they know even, they know more than I do. So even if they had to rush him back, why not DH him? You know? Yeah, I know. I know. I don't know. It it just doesn't make sense. Um, but yes. What are you I, gonna do though, when some of these players start coming back? Are you, yeah, you want to just? I mean, I, I feel like the Yankees are rolling right now, you know. So they are rolling, but there are some players that are replaceable. Like Gio, Gio or Sherla has been phenomenal. So if you can find a way to keep him on the field, 
keep him on the field. But guys like Mike Talkman, they're getting a lot of play because they're hitting home runs. But delve deeper into their numbers, he hasn't been playing that good. And yeah, same thing I'm goes looking at him right now. Yeah, same thing goes for a guy like Mike Ford. Um, Tyro Estrada has been actually pretty good, believe it or not. But um, you know, when a guy like Giancarlo Stanton comes back, I'm sorry, Talkman. I'm sorry, Ford. You gotta go. Peace. Go. You're going Damn. to the minors. Um, with Andujar, I think I said this in the last episode. Maybe you start, like you said, you start DHing him and let Urshela play third base, and then. As, as more people start to roll in and the roster spots get taken up, then you start transitioning Andujar back over to third. Um, or maybe you make you make Andujar the, every, uh, the everyday DH because he's a good hitter and you keep her shirt at third and just let Giancarlo play the outfield. I mean, yeah, he's not that it's, bad of an outfielder. No, I, I think I, at this point, I think Stanton's better outfielder than uh and Duhar is at third. I mean, I just can't yeah. believe some of the errors I've seen on Duhar made. I don't think you I really don't think you can be a major league baseball player and be that bad at a position. I think it's more of like the yips. It's like halfway through the yips. Mental. I said that that came out weird out of my mouth. It's um, all good, man. Speaking of partial yips, I think Glaber Torres and I meant to say this, and I'm not gonna I'm not lying right now. I meant to say this like four episodes ago. <laughs> so like <laughs> a month ago. Nice. The beginning when Glaber Torres started getting more time at shore after uh Wow, you got Troy Tulowitzki. Troy Tulowitzki went down. <laughs> 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 when Glaber Torres started getting more time at, at short, I noticed that a lot of the plays that Glaber Torres, I think people consider him a great defender. I I sort of do too, but I've seen too many cases of Glaber Torres where if it's a if it's a bang bang type of play where he has to rush through it, he's gonna make an accurate throw. But those plays where he kind of he can take his time a little bit and throw it, he usually makes not the worst throw, but it's like a it's like a it's a ball that hits the ground. It's a little it's bit off. Yeah. yeah, it's questionable. And I think it's partial yips. If there wasn't so much else going on in the Yankees right now and this was one thing you could focus on and somebody asked him about it, I think it would get worse. I'm just yeah. putting that out there now in case it does happen. And I want to say I told you so, but <laughs> yeah. And, yep. And the, so with the Yankee, yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. Like in, in the bang, bang plays, he doesn't make his first baseman work. And the easy plays, he's making his first baseman nervous. And that, that should yeah. never be the case. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, in the bang, bang plays, you should kind of rely on your first baseman to make that scoop or, or make that stretch or whatever. But in the bang, bang plays, like, you don't, you know, you're kind of making something out of nothing if if uh, if if you can't just make that simple throw. Yeah. Um, what else with the Yankees? I mean, they they've been playing decent. They're they're not winning every game, but they're not losing every game like they were before. We're maintaining that lead. I think we're four games over the Red Sox at this point. The Tampa Bay Rays. I mean, I think they're re- they're the real deal. Um, so something tells me that one of the one of these two teams. I'm I'm counting the Rays in. They're going to be in the playoffs, in my opinion. It's going to be it's going to be the Yankees or the Red Sox. Aren't, or one of them is going to be out at the yeah. end of the season. I'm not, I, I'm not putting the Rays. I'm not putting the Rays in the, in, in the playoffs, man. Not yet. No, I mean, it's it's been not five. T-T. It's been five weeks, man. You don't believe in them yet? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's been five weeks. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa, what's going on here? What just happened? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Wait, can you explain <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing. I was just, oh. you know, I was being, I was being loud and exaggerated oh. for no reason. I had no follow up to that, but gotcha. no, I, okay. I don't think. You know, five weeks. What is five weeks in baseball? Nothing. Okay. All right. Well, they the have Mets? the. You see the Mets lately? The Mets are trash, man. Lately, yeah, they've been trash. Yeah, their bullpen isn't doing too great. They keep fucking up those Degrom starts. I think it's back to back starts, quality starts now for Degrom. So what is okay? So, so and this happened last year because the Degrom won the Cy Young Award. He was by far the best pitcher in baseball last year, and he couldn't win any games. And this this sparked the whole kill the win debate and all this shit. I don't want to talk about kill the win. Yeah, but yeah, do let's you not go down that path. Th- yeah, no, please. Do you think <laughs> that maybe his team is it, like I don't know, man. I wish we had a major you know league what? baseball player to talk to. Do you think that that sometimes players are fielders are thinking, okay, Degrom's on the mound, I could take a day off, kind of. I'm not gonna bring my A game. We don't need to score that many runs because he's not gonna allow that many runs. Do you think that kind of shit goes to people's minds? I think it does, even subconsciously. If they don't, if they don't never admit it, but I think somewhere there ha- it has to be. There's just too. I wouldn't say this in the span of a month, but we're talking about last season and now two starts this season where it's happened so you got to kind of think that it's a little bit of a psychological thing mm. and it's not just the Mets because 
not last year, may, maybe not last year, but 2016, 2017, when Chris Sale was on fire, we'd never get him run support. He mm-hmm. would. There was there was a lot of instances with Chris Sale in 2017 where he'd go out there and give up one or two runs or or no runs, but we just wouldn't give him run support. And I remember the same thing happening with the Yankees when CC was like the man. You yeah. know, I don't know if you remember I, that at yeah. all. Yeah, but it, and and now CC's a stopper. But but now CC gets run. Now CC gets the most run support. If yeah. Like. I feel Maybe like I just, I just feel like when your ace is on the mound, that's the game that you want to make sure you win. Like you want to make sure you bring your game because this is the game we have to win. It's like not that we have to win that we that we know we have a good chance of winning. So let's get the win. It's like when you face the Orioles. This isn't a shot against UCT because the Yankees did the same shit last year, and I think this is the only game you've lost against the Orioles. I'm not sure, um, yeah. but when you face teams like that, for me. You should always bring your A game. You should never take a day off. But the games that are winnable, that you should, that everybody's expecting you to win, you should bring like play as hard as you can to get those wins because every win counts in this league. You can't take a day off. I know it's 162 games, but fuck, man, like that. It I, I just don't understand it. It just seems like when the when the best players are on the field, pitcher included. It seems like the team takes a, a like a turn for the worse in terms of scoring runs. Um, yeah. I think Rick Porcello won a bunch of games in 2016, and he got a ton of run support that year. Yeah, um, yeah, he did. But then, like you said, you have a guy like Chris Sale. He was with the White Sox at the time, but he doesn't get the same kind of run support. I, j- I just don't understand it. I don't know what the fuck. You know what? I don't. I got to look back and and see, but could it be that every time DeGrom is facing a team, they're throwing their best pitcher at DeGrom? You know, I don't know. That could be part of it. I, but Maybe I don't think m- it works that way because... because No, it, do, it, it, don't, it doesn't always work that way. You're right. But I'm it, saying like... Especially in the regular season because you kind of... It's, it's yeah. just where the chips... Let the chips fall where they may or whatever. Um, yeah, but, you know, maybe the Mets just aren't that good of a hitting team like we thought. You know, we're... we're they, it's not like they only didn't get runs for DeGrom last year. The problem was that when they didn't get runs in other games, their pitcher was giving up more runs. But in DeGrom's case, he's not giving up any runs. So it's like... Yeah. It's it's magnified, but maybe we just maybe the Mets aren't as good as a hitting team as we as they started out, which is exactly what happened last year. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not buying into the Mets. I'm not buying into the Rays. Um, I yeah, am. I'm buying into the Rays. I never buy into the Mets. So the Mets. Um, <laughs> before we go into players of the week, because this this episode is running a little long, which we have been lately. Um, there's no such thing. I was okay. just I was gonna ask you about Max Scherzer because. If you look at his fantasy numbers and you look at his his the numbers that they show you on the screen more often than not, he looks like he's having somewhat of a down year. Mm-hmm. But if you go in onto baseball reference, there's some there's some evidence that yes, he is having somewhat of a down year because he's giving up a lot of hits, so on and so forth. He's still striking out a ton of hitters. He's still an innings he's eater. Le- leads the league in FIP. And he leads the league in FIP. That's what I was going to say. So take away his field. It seems like his fielders aren't helping him at all. It seems like he's doing what he can up on the mound. But his put the fielders into the equation and his ERA balloons by almost two runs. Yeah, it's crazy. That's insane, man. I think it's all going to round out for him. Yeah. I, he, I think Max Scherzer is like, I don't know how to explain it, but so he's leading the league in innings pitch. He's leading the league in batter's face. Like, does his arm ever get tired? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to figure out, man. This like guy, shit, man. he's like one of my favorite pitchers too because of because of this. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Like it, it's it's weird. Like it's, I don't know, man. If there ever has to be an argument for him to get into the Hall of Fame, I'm gonna be pissed. Oh my god, man. Oh, he's not gonna. Ha- he's probably not gonna have the milestone numbers that other pitchers going into the Hall of Fame are gonna have. But I think he's he's in a different league when it comes to like what we've seen. And in our that, lifetime, you yeah, know? I agree. I agree, because he's not he's not the the imposing figure like a Randy Johnson, or he doesn't have the the you know the fire that Roger Clemens brought out to the mound. But he's but he has his own thing. It's unique. You know what I mean? It's it's like he's still kind of scary in his own right. I don't know if it's yeah. the two different eye colors or some shit. Yeah, um, I yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Every time I, I see him, I'm like, holy shit, this guy has two different eye colors. You know, <laughs> I know it. 
every time yeah. i see every time they zoom in on it i'm like holy shit like yep. can, can the batter see that from the mound <laughs> it's not you know it's not the pedro i don't give a fuck if i hit you in the wrist and you're out for the season you know attitude that he's he just like for, what i like about scherzer is that he's a gamer like he's yeah. just like bring it like like to start the season to move up his start in order to face bryce in the first outing like that shit is to me i love that kind of shit i don't know why but um yeah yeah me too it, me too yeah but that's just me as i said on call to the pen i do a weekly mlb player power ranking for hitters and i just want to give you my top five and tell me if you agree or disagree so at number five i had ryan braun mm. believe it or not for last week not for the season for last week and the reason being because well, I have my my reasons. I don't want to go into it because you guys are going to laugh at me and you're going to get annoyed. <clears throat> um, but yeah, to me, statistically, Ryan Braun had a phenomenal a phenomenal week last week, and he rounded it off with a walk off single in the 18th inning against who? The Mets on Saturday. Okay. Uh, yep. And then at number four, I had Michael Chavis, who, if you look at his WAR, he should be, he should be ranked one or two, but he. There's there's a few reasons why I ranked them a little bit lower, primarily because some hitters had better numbers. Like Michael Brantley had better numbers than he did, so I put him at number three. Mm -hmm. I had Cattell Marte at number two. Cattell raked last week. Did you notice it in your fantasy numbers or? Yeah, yeah, he had like two multi home run games and all that good stuff. Yo, he had a nine seven nine forty seven slugging last week. Uh, two hundred two fifty three WRC plus a five fifty seven WOBA. Like he was he was insane. And like I said, he already has nine home runs this season. He had fourteen in all of last year. So he played one hundred fifty three games last year. Hit fourteen home runs in just thirty three games this season. He already has nine. It doesn't make sense. Damn. No, no, it like, doesn't. Exactly. And then at number one, and this isn't because I'm a Yankee homer. If you go on the Call to the Pen article, you'll see how I rank this. Gary Sanchez, baby. Let me just do a clap real quick. Woo! Yeah, no, that, it's crazy what Gary Sanchez has been doing. Like, he's... This is the Gary Sanchez that if he hits like this, nobody will ever say shit about his defense, his hustle, or nothing like that. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not surprised you gave it to Gary Sanchez. Ga I mean, it, it's not even... It's, it's even the balls that, that aren't hit... He's yeah, making he's such good contact right now that it, it's it's almost scary. Yep. Like he he joined the short list of hitters um this week. I wrote a piece on that too. Uh there's four hitters since the the Statcast era, which is only 3 years. It's 2015 or 4 years. Um Aaron Judge, Giancarlo Stanton, Pete Alonso joined that list this this uh this year and now Gary Sanchez are the only four hitters to have a home run. Which is I found kind of surprising that that uh was 118 miles an hour or more. Yeah. Um, it's fucking. That's. I mean, yesterday nope. he hit a he hit a foul ball that I thought it had the third baseman tried to make the catch, he would have been knocked down by it or some shit. Um, he's he's smacking the shit out of the ball, and I love it. I love me some nope. Gary Sanchez. No Bregman or Rizzo on that list, or even Machado. All right. So to be out a little bit. So my bottom five were. Uh okay, my bottom five were at ten. Paul Paul De Jong has been decent. He's been good this year. Last last week he he raked. Adalberto Mondesi was nine. Ronnie Rodriguez was eight. Uh, Alex Bregman was seven. Bregman, I think he had two grand slams last week or some shit. Um, he had one and, for sure. I know that. I don't yeah, know. he had five home runs. He had he had five home runs and ten RBIs last week. Um, and then Nolan Arenado. Nolan Arenado started <clears throat> started off the year kind of slow, like like slow for Nolan Arenado. Like it's decent, yeah. but it was like slow. And then week after week, he's gotten better and better and mm -hmm. better and better. And last week, he was just unbelievable. Every time I checked my fantasy app, I felt like last week it was like you know six, seven, eight points every single night. Yeah. Um, I love me some Nolan Arenado, man. <laughs> and then the other guys didn't make it and and so the the way i base my top 10 is is on i i do use advanced stats and i create a rubric on those advanced stats and then i rank them that way so there's there's players that have better wars for example like i said michael chavis has the second best war um of all these players here but i ranked them fourth because if you look at his stats closer his stats weren't better than some of these other guys and it's only yeah. one week a, a one week span so um but yeah 
Manny Machado did play a little bit better, but but he's still he's still not playing like Manny Machado. I feel you, man. All right, it's okay. All right. Okay. We good? <laughs> yeah, I think we're good, man. I think it was a very good episode. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, back to you, Manny. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, I'm trying to make this a thing now. Don't forget to drop a rating and review our podcast. Um, we had a stretch at the start of the podcast last season where we were getting a lot of ratings and reviews, and we thank you guys for that. But we haven't had a reading or review in a while. So if, if any new listeners out there, you like what you're listening, you have any feedback, you, you, you know, if you don't like it, then don't do anything. But if you do like it, give us a five star rating and a review wherever you listen to your podcast. Primarily the iTunes format works better. If you listen on Google Play, um, I don't know if there's a rating or, or a review section on there, but there should be in other platforms. So that would be amazing. And to sign off, our music is by VM Varga and Rapturnal Music by Naughty Productions. You can find their links on our website and episode description. And the artwork, the logo is by the one, the only, Luigi Gomez. CT. Peace out. La paz este con nosotros. <laughs> God, <no> you- <laughs> wow. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>